Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation? The podcast that explores the reality of a word that is in danger of losing its meaning altogether. This podcast is produced by Outlast Consulting, LLC, a boutique consultancy that helps companies use innovation principles to solve their toughest business problems. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Hussein Al Musawi. Hussein Al Musawi is a renowned designer and innovator who has worked across industries around the world, creating and consulting for companies including Nike, Apple, Google, Adidas, EA Sports, Intel, and Ford Motor Company. As a regular keynote speaker on innovation and design, Hussein has also taught at several universities, such as the New School. In 2019, Hussein founded Mosawi Studios, a multidisciplinary design studio specializing in creating memorable, iconic, and bold experiences. He loves blurring the lines between product design, visual effects, and storytelling. He is the author of The Innovator's Handbook, a short guide to unleashing your creative mindset. Hussein, welcome to the show. So excited to have you on. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. So let's just dive right in. What, in your mind, is innovation? So innovation, if you look over the internet and read through books, it has all kinds of different definitions, let's say, yeah. which becomes a bit tricky. But uh, through my experience, uh, innovation is the process of enhancing, improving, and bettering something. Could be an experience, could be a product, a service, a process, anything really. Mm. So innovation is basically a great idea that is well executed that leaves a significantly positive change, regardless of big or small that idea is. But execution is definitely key. Otherwise, an idea is just going to be an idea that really doesn't move the needle. Exactly. So that's what I think innovation sums up into. Yeah, no, it's it's beautiful. It's a great definition of that enhancing, improving, and bettering something. You covered a lot just in those few words. I would love to hear you talk a bit about the bettering piece. Does it mean to make something better? And what does that look like in practice? Sure. So, so it's basically an evolution of ideas that either you come up with, either you, you can take some existing ideas and come up with a new idea through collaboration. So, I mean, everything around us, innovation has played a role in it, whether it's our cars, our phones, our TVs, cameras, laptops, you name it. Mm. So year after year, how can we improve that? How can we take it from one level to the next level? How can we reduce friction to the user? Like if they're using a phone, for example. Sure. How can it be a better experience, a more fun experience? And a lot of times, it's not things that the consumer is aware of, Mm. but you introduce new things and bring it to the table. And that's a mindset that Steve Jobs had a lot. I listened to him in one of his talks where he's mentioning that sometimes the consumer doesn't really know what they want, Mm. but you can tell them what they want and then they can't live without it. Right, right. So that's part of the bettering, taking something and taking it to the next level, improving it. And I worked a lot in footwear. I worked a lot in automotive. Mm. And we see that year after year. Like if we're working on, let's say, a shoe for a basketball player or for a soccer player. Mm. If you look at the shoes from, let's say, 2000, 2001, 2002, all the way to 2022, year after year, there's improvements in materials and technologies. And is it lightweight? Is it durable? I mean, thanks to the technologies that we have, even from different industries, we can always pull those things in. Sure. And that really helps the product to evolve and become something better. So collaboration, I would say, is key, Mm -hmm. not just with individuals around us and people who are different from us, but also collaboration with different industries. Uh, And there's lots of examples that we can share around that, if you like. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great space for us to explore. I want to help me on something you said about footwear. Footwear and automotive both have sort of this kind of annual cadence to them, where the expectation is that next year's model will be better than this year's model. So the expectation of an innovation is kind of built into the way the product works. It's not like something that you buy and keep for 15 years and expect it to just not break. Absolutely. And that's why I love this bettering part of what you're talking about, because it's about creating this momentum of improvement Mm -hmm. where it looks natural and evolutionary, but I'm sure you were working on the shoe that's coming out three years from now. Exactly. Yep. And the shoe is coming out five years from now. And what technology platform are we going to shift to? How do we look out into the future, even though it's coming up to the consumer on sort of an annual basis? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, in different companies I've worked with, innovation is usually like, for example, when I was in Adidas, we worked on things that are four years out. Mm -hmm. But then we had a team that worked on things that are 10 years out. And then there was also a team that was like closest to the market. And that was mm-hmm. like two years or one years out. Yep. So it's really a process where 
the team looks at the bigger picture. What could the future look like? Blue sky. For example, imagine a shoe, a car, whatever, that comes out in the year 2100. Mm -hmm. A car that is on Mars. Right. So the more you change those constraints that you have when you're designing something or building something, the more you can think outside of the box. Mm -hmm. Idea is to take those crazy and wild ideas, package them, and look at reality. Okay, we're in 2022 now. What exists? What technologies are out there? Who can we collaborate with? Who can we partner up with? Maybe it opens up some opportunities to come up with technology that doesn't exist. It all starts with the idea and how can you reach those ideas and those new exciting ideas that do not exist at the moment. Mm. And a lot of people also confuse innovation with invention. Yeah. So you don't really need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to come up with something that is groundbreaking. And that's really something I think that I was super interested in, like working with when I was with Apple, when I was with Ford, when I'm with uh, Adidas, Nike, whoever. From the outside, you look at these giants and these companies as, you know, they come up with the next big groundbreaking idea. But the thing is, it's all baby steps and it's small mm -hmm. steps and it's all incremental and different teams, different minds collaborating together, putting, you know, uh, pieces of the puzzle together. Right. And then that's how you see the, the wow moment of, wow, this big, uh, cool idea that no one thought of. But it all starts with the baby steps. That's really key. Mm -hmm. The baby steps. Yeah, no, that's a great call out. And the roll call of companies you laid out there they are at the forefront in their industries of innovation and forward thinking. And so it's really encouraging, I think, for innovators and in all companies to be able to understand that it's really about the small steps that add up to the big wow moments. Exactly, exactly. And even as a kid, like I was always an aspiring designer. I saw these cool inventions around the world and I'm like, how did I not think of that? Yeah. Oh, this looks so simple or this looks so cool. But here's the thing it shouldn't be overwhelming innovation. Right. And it's all about having the right mindset. Mm. And when I had the opportunity to work with the biggest brands in the world, the most innovative brands in the world, I really saw that it wasn't big things that, you know, led to innovation. It was all these small insights and small things that we can all do mm -hmm. that can change our mindset and give us a shift in our mindset and lead to innovation and innovative thinking, because it's all about thinking outside the box and coming up with cool ideas mm. or cool ideas that are good. Not, not every cool idea is good, but <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, it, and the momentum that is created by several small ideas can get you to that big, cool, implementable idea. Absolutely. The one that actually can be that game changer. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you're right. It looks from the outside like they just went from A to Z, you know, just one big leap. But it's a combination of very small incremental steps along the way. And your point around invention versus innovation is a great one. Each of those steps might not have been inventing a thing. It might have been borrowing this from the food industry or borrowing this thing from the space program or whatever to help move the needle in terms of what consumers are looking for. Exactly. So like, I mean, two examples, when we were in the footwear industry, when I was in the footwear industry, we were looking at traction, for example, for basketball, for any kind of shoe. Mm. We'd look at different tire companies, bicycle tires, car tires. How do they work with traction? If we're looking for a good fit system, how does NASA do it when they spend, send their astronauts to the space? Oh, right. Uh, seat belts, for example. So really looking outside of, I mean, things that don't relate when you mix them together and you fuse them together, some really nice, uh, crazy ideas come out of it. Yeah, I can imagine. Another cool story is Steve Jobs in 2007, hmm. when the iPhone was going to come out. So he took two different inventions. The first was uh, Fingerworks, a company that Apple acquired. Hmm. And Fingerworks, basically, they, they had these kind of tablets that you would do this finger gestures on it. And it was for people that had issues with the wrist. They couldn't use the mouse a lot. So they, gave, they did this as an alternative. Hmm. And somebody at Apple was using this device. And when they saw it, they were like, cool, uh, we could implement this in a way in, in our you know, devices or such. So that turned into a touchscreen, which Apple came up with on the iPhone. That was a big innovation. Yeah. But did Apple invent it? No. SoundJam was another company that Apple acquired. Hmm. And SoundJam turned into what was later iTunes. And the iTunes aspect of things and then the, the touchscreen with Fingerworks, that's what made the first iPhone special. Yeah. And yeah. if you look at the innovation <laughs> process from the first iPhone to where we are now, it's just incremental. It's just adding on to what they had, but they had a really good, strong DNA to start with. 
Mm. And they did not sit around and wait for their people in their company to come up with the technology or the approach they needed. They went out and acquired it. 100%, 100%. And that's actually an ego thing also. I see that. Uh, I don't know if it's an ego thing or if it's an ignorance thing, mm -hmm. but uh, sometimes companies, even individuals, they think that they should be the ones who come up with all ideas. Right. Not at all. I mean, innovation part of it is being open-minded, thinking outside the box, building and executing. But then another part of it is collaborating, like Apple was acquiring different companies. So even being smart in your approach, in your process, mm. that's really key. Because at the end of the day, you want to create an innovative ecosystem right. that works and produces great ideas. Mm. An innovative ecosystem. That is the goal, right? Because that is the goal. <laughs> I, think, I think those of us who have worked inside of big companies and in, even small companies know the difference between an innovative product and an innovative ecosystem. You can get lucky and create an innovative product, but it takes an innovative ecosystem to deliver iPhone then iPad and the consistent innovative game-changing products to the market. 100%, 100%. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it all started with my internship at Nike. Mm. And when I started my internship, I always thought of Nike, as most people, that it's a sports company. Right. But then on the inside, they're like, no, Nike is not a sports company. It's an innovation company. We just do sports products. Mm. So that's really changed the way I looked at things. And it's really a, a good designer, not just a designer, really, every innovative person's mindset of how they approach a problem, how they try to come up with cool ideas, good ideas that leave a positive impact. And it doesn't matter if you're doing a car, a shoe, a laptop, it's all about the mindset. Right, right, right. I love that. And it, and it shows in the way things come to life from Nike. It, it definitely shows the difference between being an innovation company that happens to make footwear versus being a shoe company that tries to be innovative. So that's what innovation is, enhancing, improving, bettering. What isn't innovation? I think we touched on this, but an important thing is that innovation is not invention. Mm. And it's not the need to reinvent the wheel. Even if you're not inventing something, I speak about myself when I was just getting started out. Sure. I always thought that every idea had to be this big next thing that everybody's going to talk about in the world. Not necessarily. Right. Again, it's all about those baby steps. It's all about having persistence. When you come up with an idea, being flexible. So going from point A to B, Let's say that's your goal as an innovator, but really you always land on point C. Mm -hmm. So having that flexibility and, you know, mm -hmm. going left and right until you get to the idea, learning from your mistakes, failure, it's a big part of it, willing to fail and learning from those failures, it really pushes you and it allows you to get to that innovation spot. So yeah, innovation is not an invention for sure. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. How do you think the two became so erroneously synonymous? Yeah, I mean... I guess they both have to do with coming up with an idea that leaves a positive impact. Mm -hmm. Now, they're at different scales. Invention is something that has never been done before. It's totally new, groundbreaking. And then innovation is, uh, let's say, taking those baby steps towards improving something. Right. Yeah, I think just as a, I don't know if that's a good answer. <laughs> no, it's a great answer because what, what it highlights is that when you look at invention, you're looking back at nothing. Mm -hmm. When you talk about invention, there was not this thing, and then there was this thing, and there's a, a moment. It was invented. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about innovation, it's often an evolution based on an insight or a problem to be solved or a job to be done. So it's by definition more evolutionary. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And part of that walk might be inventing something, but it doesn't necessarily have to be part of that progression toward an innovative solution. So I, I think you're exactly right. That makes perfect sense to me. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so you've mentioned some of the places you've had the opportunity to do this type of work. How has innovation shaped your career? So yeah, as I mentioned, it all started for me like the innovation process with Nike when I started as an intern. Mm -hmm. Before that, I didn't really look at things through the lens of innovation. It was all about cool design because I'm a designer. Sure. Like, aesthetically something that looks cool. Maybe it solves a problem, but I never really had a clear process in terms of something that is innovative, that is going to improve the experience, the process, be something that is evolutionary of what existed before. Sure. So with Nike, that really changed my mindset towards things. And then when I went from company to company, whether I was consulting, working with them through my company, whether I was working with them full-time. So I've worked with Apple, Amazon, Ford, 
uh, Nike, Adidas, Pepsi. So lots of different companies who are in the innovation space. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to me because none of these companies really had like an innovation guidebook. Like, all right, you're on board. This is how we're going to innovate. But it's all about the mindset. It was kind of like brilliant minds who got together and did things in a certain way. And I saw lots of this overlap between different companies. Uh, And that's what really pushed me towards writing my book, The Innovator's Handbook. mm -hmm. And it's all about these small insights that change your mindset and make you look at things through the lens of innovation and innovative thinking. So yeah, it's not as overwhelming as we sometimes think it is, Yeah, but it's small hacks and small shifts in the way we look at stuff that can uh, allow us to be more innovative. For example, I mean, we mentioned collaboration. Mm -hmm. Another thing is being super laser focused. Let's say I'm working on a shoe. A shoe needs to be comfortable. It needs to have good traction. It needs to have good fit. Let's say the shoe is about these three things. Mm. But if you start to look at all three things and you want to make the next shoe that solves all those three problems, you want to come up with an innovative, as innovative product as just looking at solving for fit, right? solving for comfort, solving for traction. So what's the best shoe that you can do that has the best traction? And then you kind of have these three buckets and you have different ingredients. And then it's all about mixing and matching, but you're super focused on solving just one problem at a time. Mm. So I saw that a lot in different companies. And this is just one example of the kind of, let's say shifts in the mindset that allow you to think of things through a different scope. Mm, That's a great one. I would imagine it opens up the door for productive trade-offs. So if you're trying to solve all three of the major categories at once, then you could be over-constraining your system. And if you focus on one at a time, it allows you to make trade-offs in the other areas and, and learn a bit about, well, how important is traction? This is the best possible shoe from a traction standpoint. Do people want it? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then also like the first principles method. That's something that Elon Musk used a lot. And I love that process. And we did use it a lot in footwear when I worked on different projects. Sure. And the first principles method is basically taking a product that exists. You break it down into its core and different parts. Mm -hmm. Lay them out all on a table. For example, if we had a shoe, we had the cushion, we had the midsole, we had the outsole, we had the laces, everything. We just broke the shoe apart. And then we started to ask questions like if we're solving for, if we're designing for comfort, does this really give us the most comfortable shoe? Does this part? or this part, or this part. And then we start to question each part and see if we really need it. Can we take it out? Can we put something better in there? Mm. What can we put in there? So asking these good questions and then putting the shoe back together, come up with a shoe that is uh, more innovative, maybe more Mm post-productive. And it just really breaks the stigma of this is how things are done, how they should be done. And you're kind of challenging the way it was created in the first place. Right, right. Because a lot of things around us, we just think it's a given, like, okay, this is how cars are built. This is how laptops are built. I mean, the way Elon Musk did his SpaceX spaceships, he reduced the price of how much it was built, like the batteries and everything else, Mm. just because he went through this process. Mm. And the way things are built aren't necessarily the way they should be built. Mm. Well said, well said. And we do bring that assumption to a lot of things. Consciously questioning that assumption has to be a very valuable approach. I haven't gotten my hands on it yet, but I'm really excited to check out your book because I love the title, if nothing else, (laughs) because it really hits home with the fact that there is no innovation degree. You know what I mean? Exactly. You can't learn what you need to learn about how to innovate in a company or in the business world from a university experience. Mm -hmm. You have to learn it as a apprentice, you know, in, in the real world. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so the book, it's uh, called The Innovator's Handbook, since you mentioned the book. It's out September 6th. It's up for pre-orders now on Amazon. And that was my whole intent behind it. Give the reader a front row seat into these companies and show that innovation isn't as overwhelming as it seems. It's small tricks, small hacks in your mindset that can allow you to see things differently. I also have a chapter with some practical exercises of like how you can think outside the box and things that I've tried in different workshops, even when I teach that do work. Yeah. Uh, for example, you mentioned the assumptions thing. So one thing is always to take the assumption of, let's say restaurants serve food. Restaurants have chairs and tables. That's an assumption that we all know. All right, let's flip that around. Restaurants don't have food. They don't serve food. They don't have chairs and tables then what does that restaurant look like? Mm. So now that opens up a whole new perspective for you of looking at things and, right. okay, then what can this restaurant look like? Well, what could be inside it if there's no chairs and tables and, and so on? Yeah. So there's a whole chapter on practical exercises as well. It's a short, fun book. 
it's not the ultimate guide to innovation. And I mentioned that in the book, <laughs> it's a short guide to kind of spark your curiosity and supercharge your mindset to start innovating and thinking outside the box. That's fantastic. I love that you leave it kind of at that point, because as an innovator, you know, that's where innovation starts. You can't write a full book on A to Z, how to innovate. It depends on your environment. And so having a handbook that gives you the tools and kind of a good starting place and something to refer back to as you work through your career and through your products. Exactly. I think that's a great thing to add. And it's all perspectives. I'm sure if you were to write the book, you would have different ideas. And again, it's all about just sharing different perspectives, uh, what we think works for innovation and having a good innovative mindset. Yeah, that's what this podcast is all about. You know, there's no right answer on what innovation is, right? It's all perspectives and they're all useful in their own way. Mm -hmm. So it's been a great conversation. Before I let you go, I just want to find out if you have any advice for innovators. I think we touched on a few of them, like learning to fail. Mm -hmm. And these are also some of the chapters in the book, not being afraid of failures. I don't even like to call them failures, but they're all experiences and they're all lessons. Mm -hmm. So the top innovators and let's say CEOs and executives, they probably failed a lot. And it's that experience that gives them that uh, advantage over others, mm. that they know what works and what doesn't work. So they know what not to do next time they're trying to do something. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing, learning to fail. Being curious is a really important one. As kids, we're always curious. We're asking questions. I have a three and a half year old. She's asking me all kinds of questions every day. <laughs> but as we grow up, we kind of stop asking questions and we also are pushed by society to not ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So that also makes us less curious. So being curious sponge, I'd say, soaking things in, being open to everything. And then that kind of allows you to think of things differently. And Leonardo da Vinci is a great example of that. His notebooks were filled with curiosities and questions of what does a woodpecker's tongue look like? Yeah. Why is the sky blue? So curiosity, collaboration, the more we collaborate with different industries, with different people, like collaboration and diversity, I'd say, who are different from us, mm -hmm. different cultures, backgrounds, races, religions, all of that stuff. The more different your teams are, the more innovative you could be just because everybody brings a different perspective to the table. Mm. Like I've worked on teams where people speak different languages and it's been super interesting and they're from different countries. Right. And everybody comes with a different background, different culture, and we all bring something new to the table. So I think those three are like, I'd say my top three. Mm. Maybe the last one I'd say is just be positive and, you know, keep pushing and use the negative people and the naysayers as your fuel, because it's really easy to be put down or let down sometimes. Yes. And the innovation process, it's a, it's a long process, but it's also a fun process. So enjoy the ride, but yeah, use the negativity to your advantage. So, <laughs> I like it. I like so I, it. I'd say those four things. Yeah, no, those are great. Failing. And thinking about it, not in the context of the word failure, but more in experiences and lessons. Exactly. And then curiosity, maintaining that curiosity. I, I love that. And Da Vinci's notebook, if you haven't seen them, you know, Google it and just, <laughs> just take a look at what those pages look like. You're right. It's curiosity personified. So that's a perfect example of curiosity. Collaboration and diversity. I think diversity and innovation go hand in hand. I, I talk about it all the time. I think innovation is key to diversity and diversity is key to innovation. And yeah, the collaborative aspect of that, having an environment where you can leverage the diversity, where you can have a diverse team and it doesn't become a distraction. Exactly. And if you don't have a positive, healthy culture, you can't make the most of the diversity you bring to the table, even if you bring it to the table. Mm -hmm. And then the positivity, I love that. It's really key to making progress anywhere because they're going to be setbacks. And if you can't maintain a positive attitude, those setbacks become permanent and you don't make progress. Exactly. Yeah. Those are great. Love those. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure, Hussein. And I'm really excited that we had a chance to chat. Thank you so much for your definition of innovation around enhancing, improving, and bettering products and services. And I look forward to staying connected and staying in touch. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this week's show. You can drop us a line on Twitter at Outlast LLC, O-U-T-L-A-S-T-L-L-C, or follow us on LinkedIn where we're Outlast Consulting. Until next time, keep innovating, whatever that means.